hope all uh, who would like to, to be with us today wake up. And now uh, we start our final day of this uh, beautiful, interesting week uh, uh, containing a lot of uh, uh, talks. And uh, our first speaker today is Rosemary. And we are really very happy that we have this talk because every time when Rosemary gives a talk, we have a lot of some influence. From the <laughs> top. So, thank you very much for joining us. Okay, well, Elena, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to take part in these meetings. And what I want to talk to you about today um, is something about designs for 36 treatments. And so, there are some designs that I'll tell you about called square lattice designs but there isn't one for 36 treatments. And I'm going to tell you how we found some substitutes for that. But this talk is not just about the designs, it's about the way we found them and various silly mistakes that happened on the way. So this is an outline. I will tell you what square lattice designs are. Then I will tell you about something called sesquirays. Then the first step in the discovery. Then the main part of the talk about what these designs are. Then another of these mistakes along the way. And then some other rather strange things that happened before we got to the end. So what is a square lattice design? So this is from my background in agricultural research where you want to compare many new varieties of crop, so this might be wheat or something like that, on a large number, as I say, a large number of these. And even at a good experimental farm, the plots of land, the experimental units, are not all alike. And so it's sensible to group the plots into blocks so that the plots within a block are fairly alike. And because there are a large number of varieties, the blocks are usually too small to have all the varieties. Now, just for reasons of managing the experiment, it's often convenient if the blocks themselves can be grouped into what I call replicates in such a way that each variety occurs exactly once in each replicate. And usually such a block design is called resolvable. Um, some people actually call them resolved and Williams called them generalized lattice designs precisely because of these lattice designs I'm going to tell you about. Now, I just want you to notice that Williams in 1977, he's one of the characters who's going to occur again during the talk. So, what are square lattice designs? Frank Yates was head of statistics at Rothenstedt Experimental Station for quite a long time. And in 1936 and 37, he introduced these square lattice designs. In each of these, the number of varieties is a square number, n squared. And each replicate consists of n blocks of n plots. So be abstract for a while and imagine the varieties are simply numbered in an n by n square array. And you look at that array, the rows of the array form the blocks in the second replicate, in the first replicate, and the columns form the blocks of the second replicate. So for two replicates, it's very straightforward. And that's what he introduced in 1936. He realized he needed to go further. So supposing I usually use R for the number of replicates. And if that is bigger than two, then we need some mutually orthogonal Latin squares. In fact, we need R minus two of them. And each of those Latin squares, each letter in it determines a block. So I'll just remind you about the Latin squares. A Latin square of order n is an n by n array of cells 
in which N symbols are placed. I usually make them letters, one per cell. The important thing is that each symbol occurs once in each row and once in each column. So here's a Latin square of order four, letters A, B, C, and D. And I think you can see it if I look in any row or any column, each of them comes just once. Now, if we have two Latin squares of the same size, we say they're orthogonal to each other. If, when I put one on top of the other, each letter of the first square occurs exactly once with each letter of the second square. So here are a pair of orthogonal Latin squares of order four. One on the letters A, B, C, and D one on the Greek letters alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And to show you what I mean, on the left, I've highlighted the letter A. And if we look at those positions on the right, we've got alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, all the different letters. And that works for all choices of letters on the left. So that's just to remind you what I mean by orthogonal Latin squares. And if you have a collection of Latin squares of the same size and every pair is orthogonal, then that's called a set of mutually orthogonal Latin squares. So I'm going to show you on an example how we build a square lattice design. I'm going to show you on 16, but that shows you the pattern for other numbers. So first of all, I say here are my varieties they're numbered one to 16, and I've just put them in a square array. First two replicates are easy. So these long, thin rectangles are the blocks. So what have I done here? The first row has one, two, three, and four. I make that into a block. The next row, five, six, seven, and eight, that's a block. And so on. For replicate two, what I'm doing is looking at the columns, 1, 5, 9, 13, 2, 6, 10, 14, and so on. So that's the easy case. I just take the rows and the columns, and that makes the blocks. Supposing I want a third replicate. Well, then I have to look in this Latin square here, and I say, look at letter capital A. Where does it come? 1, 6, 11, 16, and that makes a block. And then letter B, 2, 5, 12, 15, gives me the second block. And if I just want three replicates, I stop there. If I want a fourth replicate, I need to come on to this second square, which is orthogonal to the first one. And let's see, where does letter alpha come? There, 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 there. Ein, sieben, zwölf, und vierzehn. Yes, which is what we've got there. And if you want a fifth replicate, I couldn't fit it on this screen, but there is a third Latin square orthogonal to those two, and that will give me a fifth replicate if required. And that's the pattern you use for other numbers as well. Now, I have not put up a definition of concurrence. What I mean by the concurrence of, of two varieties is how many blocks do they both come in? And if you look at what we've got here, one and two come in that block, but they never come in the same block again. So they've got concurrence one. And everything here has either got concurrence one or there's a few that have got concurrence zero. So I have to tell you a little bit about efficiency factors and optimality, and this may be new for some of you. So if I've got a set curly capital T of varieties and an incomplete block design for them, 
I'm going to assume that all blocks have size K and every treatment occurs R times. Then we make a concurrence matrix, which I'll call capital lambda. The rows and the columns are indexed by the varieties and the entry in row I and column J is equal to the number of blocks in which treatments, <coughs> sorry, when I put treatments, I meant varieties. I use both words, um, I and J both occur. And then something called the scaled information matrix, I make like this. I take lambda, I divide it by R and K, and I subtract that from the identity matrix. Then it's quite easy to check that the constant vectors are in the null space of this matrix. The eigenvalues for the other eigenvectors are really important in working out if it's a good block design. They're called canonical efficiency factors, and we'd like them all to be as large as possible. And one way of measuring if they're all as large as possible is just to take their harmonic mean. Why is that? Well, what I want to do is estimate the difference between variety A and variety B. And I want to do that for all pairs of varieties. And when you make an estimate, it has a variance. The bigger the variance, the more uncertain is your estimate. So you want variances to be small. And you can show that the average of these variances is equal to this product. On the right, I've got what would be the average variance if we could do an experiment with the same resources, <coughs> all right, but no need to have blocks. And this thing here is one over this mu A. Now we want variances to be small and we would therefore like mu A to be large. It can't be any bigger than one because this thing obviously can't be better than what you could do without blocks. And so the technical term I'm using, we say that a design is A optimal if it maximizes mu A amongst all designs with specific values of R and K and the number of varieties. There are other sorts of optimality, but this is the only one I'm concerned with in this talk. And I will probably normally just say optimal. And this is rather nice. So you see many years after Frank Yates introduced these designs, Ching Shui Cheng and I were able to show that square lattice designs are optimal amongst block designs of this size. We have to have R less than or equal to N plus one because of the constraint on the maximal number of mutually orthogonal Latin squares. And we even managed to show that even if you allow non-resolvable designs to compete with these, square lattice designs are still the best possible. But there is a problem when n is six. <clears throat> if n is two, three, four, five, skip one, seven, eight, nine, then there is a complete set of n minus one mutually orthogonal Latin squares of order n. So if we use these, we get a square lattice design for n squared treatments in n times n plus one blocks of size n. And going right up to that size, you have everything coming with everything else in a block exactly once. So you get a balanced, incomplete block design. Now, I don't particularly care for bigger numbers because I'm not 
doing experiments on infinitely numbers of varieties, but you obviously see what's missing from here is the number six. And six is missing from there, and it's very badly missing from there. Not only is there not a complete set of mutually orthogonal Latin squares of order six, there isn't even a pair of mutually orthogonal Latin squares of order six. So if you've got 36 treatments, you can do a square lattice design for two replicates just by using rows and columns of the array, or you could go to three replicates by using one Latin square, but you can't go any further. So what do we do? Well, what some people do when they can't find a nice answer is get their computer out. And I know very well that some people listening to this here are in that category. Now, this is this same Williams that I mentioned before, and I'll mention him again. In 1976, he and his PhD supervisor used a computer search to find a design for 36 treatments in blocks of size six and going up to four replicates. So this is what you can't do with a square lattice design. And because you can't do it with a square lattice design, you can't restrict the concurrences to be zero and one. So they had a few that had concurrence two. And they calculated the value of its A criterion, it's 0 0.836. And that's actually pretty good. If there had been a square lattice design, it would have been 0 0.840. So that is really quite close. So that's where things stayed for quite a long time. So now, change of subject. I'm going to tell you something about some designs called sesquiarrays. And this is some joint work with Thomas Nelson and Peter Cameron. And here you can see them at a statistics conference in Poland in 2018. So they introduced the concept of a sesquiarray. So this is a row column design. And now little r means rows because that's what I tend to do in a row column design. R is the number of rows. C is the number of columns. V is the number of letters. And there are various conditions to be satisfied. First one is quite easy. Exactly one letter in each row column intersection. The second one, no letter occurs more than once in any row or column. Each letter occurs a constant number of times, and so then you can work out an equation like that. Now, the two interesting conditions are these ones down here. A4 says if you look in any row and any column, the number of letters they have in common is constant, and then you can do some sums and find out that that constant has to be the same as that one there. And the last condition says that if you look in any two rows, the number of letters common to them has to be a constant, and then you can calculate that, that constant has to be that. So I'll just, I'm not going to look at all possible parameter combinations. But let's suppose we have these parameters for some integer n, n plus one rows, n squared columns, and the number of letters is n times n plus one. And here's an example with n equals three, just to show you how it works. So that's four rows. I believe that's nine columns. And I think there should be 12 different letters in there. So one condition that this satisfies, and I've illustrated that with letter A, each letter occurs in all rows except one. If you go back to my conditions, each letter occurs the same number of times. And this actually implies this one as well, because each row is missing just each letter is missing from exactly one row. 
The second condition you can see on here is what A4 says. If you look in any row and any column, it should be the same number of letters in common. And what have we got here? D, G, J, D, G, J. And of course, the one they don't have in common is this A, because A is missing from that row, even though it comes in all the other rows. So the third part is telling you a bit about the story of how we discovered these new designs. So Thomas Nelson and Peter Cameron were trying to give a general construction of sesquiarrays for those parameters that I've just shown you, for all n at least three. And Thomas found a general construction using a pair of mutually orthogonal Latin squares of order n. So of course that doesn't work for small numbers like one and two, and it also doesn't work for this bad number six. That motivated Peter Cameron to find a sesquiarray for the special case that n equals six. Later on, I got involved in this project and I found a simpler version of Thomas's construction. It needs a Latin square of order n, but it doesn't need orthogonal Latin squares. So we've covered n equals six. If we'd known that earlier, Peter Cameron would not have gone on and found this nice design for n equals six. So this is an example where getting stuck and making the wrong decision at one point actually led to something else good. So now let's go on and tell you something about these new designs. We want 36 treatments or varieties, whatever you want to call them, in blocks of size six. Now, as I've already said, six is uniquely bad amongst positive integers in that in some sense it's big enough to have a pair of orthogonal Latin squares, but there are no such squares. But six is uniquely good in a completely different way. The symmetric group S6 of all permutations of one to six has an automorphism, which is not an inner automorphism. Inner automorphism, I remind you, is just conjugation. And this is the only symmetric group that has a special automorphism like that. And that outer automorphism can be used to construct the Sylvester graph. Some of you may already know about this graph. It has 36 vertices or with valency five. So what does it look like? The vertices are going to be these circles. So the cells of a six by six grid. And the columns, I just called them one to six. And the rows are labeled by the one factorizations, or if you like, edge colorings of the complete graph on six points. So by F, that's how I've labeled the first row, I've got, say, one color. This is the edges one, two, three, four, and five, six. Another color is for one, three, two, five, four, six, and so on. Now, if you conjugate that by swapping the pairs one and two, that first set of edges stays the same, but one, three, two, five, four, six gets turned into two, three, one, five, four, six, and so on. And as you look down, you can see that they, these two one factorizations have just that single factor in common. And now I'm going to take advantage of that. 
So if I take any two of these, and I, I've shown it you for just two specific ones, but it's true for any pair, they have one of those things in common. And I'm going to use that to make these edges. One of the things they have is one, two. So I'm going to join the vertex, which is row F and column one, to the vertex, which is row G and column two, and then put in that other one like that. They have three, four in common. That gives me those two edges. They have five, six in common, and that gives me those two edges. This graph has a lot of automorphisms. If you use S6 in the usual way, it permutes the columns and the rows at the same time. And the outer automorphism of S6 actually swaps over the rows and the columns. That's really where this nice outer automorphism comes from because the number of one factorizations is the same as the number of points. So this graph, with those things there, we know we've got a transitive group of automorphisms, that is permutations of the vertices taking edges to edges. So it looks the same from any vertex. So here's a vertex, I've called it A, and it has five edges, joining it to one thing in each other column, one thing in each other row. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to call this a starfish. I'm going to call it capital S of A. It's the five edges coming out of A. Now, in earlier versions of this talk, when we were just working on the ideas, I called this set of six vertices a spider centered at A. Well, you know, if you're working with mathematicians, they're a bit pedantic about how you use words. And Peter Cameron pointed out that spiders usually have more legs than that, so this couldn't be a spider. But there are some starfish with five edges. Sorry, five edges, five legs. And there is a photo of one. Um, that I found off the coast of Queensland once. So that explains why we're now calling these things starfish. Now, supposing we consider two points A and B in the same column and look at the starfish centered on A and the starfish centered on B. And let's consider some point C over here. Now, if there's an edge from A to C and an edge from A to B, then if we look back the other way, if we're sitting in C, the starfish centered on C would have vertices A and B, and they're both in the same column. We know that can't happen, so that tells me that the starfish centered on A and the starfish centered on B, they have no vertices in common. So if I simply look at one column, the six starfish centered on the vertices in that column, they do not overlap at all. So they will give us a single replicate of six blocks of size six. And here I've written it out. You can't possibly check this as, as I'm going along, but so I've put a capital A for the starfish whose center is there, and these are its other points. We have something in every other row, something in every other column. And likewise for B, you have these other points. So that's just a Latin square, perhaps a rather convoluted way of making one, but it's a Latin square. 
So this is how we're going to construct our resolved designs. If we just have a few replicates, we use all the rows, we use all the columns, and we can use the starfish of one particular column. That's just the same as doing a square lattice design. For larger values of R, we can use some of these. We could use all rows as one replicate. We could use all columns as a replicate. And then for various columns, up to six columns, we could use all the starfish of those columns. Now, supposing there's an edge from little a to little c in the graph then that tells us that A and C occur in the starfish SA and in the starfish SC. So if you're using a galaxy, we call it a galaxy, of starfish from two or more columns, then some treatment concurrences will be bigger than one because you're going to have some twos like that. Now, let's look at some other nice combinatorial properties of the Sylvester graph. So I started at A, I've drawn everything at distance one. Now let's go at distance one from that place there. You see they're all new. And what that's telling us is the Sylvester graph has no triangles. Now let's go and look at what we get by going on one step from that one up there. And those things are all new again. So that's telling us the Sylvester graph has no triangles and no quadrilaterals. So that means if I start at A and take all paths of length two from that, you actually end up covering everything which is a in a different row or a different column from A. So there's two nice consequences of this. As I've said before, if I make consider the starfish centered on A and the starfish centered on D, they are definitely both in the starfish centered on A and centered on D. But a consequence of this is that is the only way that two distinct treatments can occur together in more than one block can't happen in any other way. And the second consequence of this, and this is something I like very much, is that we've got an association scheme here. So we consider these relations on pairs of vertices. They could be different, but in the same row. They could be different, but in the same column. They could be joined by an edge in the Sylvester graph, or they could be a distance two in the Sylvester graph. And these relations form an association scheme. And when I say association scheme, I mean in its original meaning. So the, the thing has to be commutative and homogeneous. Symmetry. Hmm? Symmetry. So I, I don't have directed edges in my thing. And that means, so if you have an association scheme and the concurrences just depend on the relation in the association scheme, then that block design is called partially balanced. And the information matrix belongs to the Bose-Mesner algebra of the association scheme. And so it's very easy to find out its eigenspaces. They're quite straightforward to find. And given that, it's very easy to calculate the eigenvalues and hence the canonical efficiency factors. So what are our designs going to look like? I've already used this word galaxy. Now, you probably think that a galaxy is a collection of stars. 
I looked in my dictionary and apparently galaxy is also the word for a collection of starfish. So when I put star with a little m, I'll mean we'll have using m columns to make starfish. Or if I put a capital R as well, we'll also have a replicate of all rows. If I put a C as well, it's all columns. Or I could have all rows, all columns, and some galaxies. And as I said, if M is six, then the design is partially balanced with respect to that association scheme. We can easily calculate the canonical efficiency factors. Even if not, we just ask GAP to do it for us and calculate them exactly. Now, the large group of automorphisms tells us that we can swap R and C, we'll get the same canonical efficiency factors. And it also says using the galaxies of starfish from M columns, given that we've got S6 acting there, it doesn't matter which subset of M columns we use. So for a partially balanced design with six replicates, for each column, we make a replicate whose blocks are the six starfish whose centers are in that column. So you get concurrence two, the vertices joined by an edge, one distance to zero otherwise. As I say, it's quite easy to calculate the canonical efficiency factors. I won't go through the details and you get this value of mu. Remember, we want to get this big as 0.8442. And the, what we're comparing this with, if there had been a square lattice design, it would be 0.8537, but that doesn't exist. So we can't achieve that. Seven replicates, we do what we just did and add a replicate whose blocks are the columns. So the concurrences are slightly different from what we had before. Again, you can easily do the calculations we get a value of 0.85 compared with something very slightly bigger for the square lattice design that doesn't exist. And for eight replicates, we put in all rows and all columns as well as all the starfish. So concurrence is one in most places and two just for things joined by an edge. And we calculate the harmonic mean 0.855 and now, this is interesting. If there had been a balanced design and you add one more replicate, it's actually not as good because this thing about the balanced design being best, you know, works up to that point, but it doesn't work for higher values. So here we've beaten what you would have done before. So here's a quick table. This is R galaxies, R minus one galaxies with columns or R minus two with rows and columns. That's what we would get for a square lattice design. The red ones are these nice partially balanced designs. These blue entries are things that don't exist. So they were giving us upper bounds. And this is what those people got by computer search in 1976, 0.836. And if we come over here, we've slightly beaten that at 0.838. And you'll also notice as you look in any of these, you do better by going over to that column there. So by putting in the rows and the columns and having fewer galaxies. So, Slight break again. How did we discover these new designs? They are just a fortunate byproduct of a wrong turning in the search for sesquiarrays. arrays. So, supposing we take the one of these with seven replicates and think about its dual, how do we turn that into a sesquiarray? array? 
So I was trying to type up something about these designs and Peter was sitting opposite me and I was feeling a bit lazy and I said to him, is your sesquire for n equals six written out explicitly? Because then I thought I could just copy and paste. He said, oh, not yet. I'll just program Gap to do it for me. And a bit later, actually what he didn't say, oh no, he said something very rude. Ah, my construction doesn't work after all. Each column has the correct set of letters, but their arrangement in rows is wrong. Remember, no letter is allowed to occur more than once in a row, but he had some rows with some letters coming five times. So this is just a quick diagram. When I have write six there, it's actually a set of six columns. And these numbers in here mean a set of six letters. And here you can see that this set of six letters just keeps popping up in row one and never pops up in any of the other rows. So Peter started thinking about it. And a bit later he said, ah, the only hope of putting this right is to permute the letters in each column. I need six permutations. Each permutation must fix the first row and one other. The rest of each permutation should give a circle on the other five rows. And I want these circles to have every row following each other row exactly once. And my answer to that was, oh, easy peasy. That's just a neighbor balance design for six treatments in six circular blocks of size five. I made one of those for experiments in forestry 25 years ago. And there it is. These circles are the six blocks. They've each got five things in it. And if you look at say treatment one, there we've got one followed by five, by six, by two, by four, by three, and it's similar for everything else. So that was the design that was going wrong. So let's look at this. One doesn't occur in that, but you can see two, three, four, five, six like that. And if I apply that, all I've done, well, Maybe if I think of it the other way, that two went down there and six popped up to five and so on. So if I'm going to do something similar using this one in the next column, then one would be pushed down to three. In the next column, one would be pushed down there. Then it would be pushed down to five. Then it would be pushed down here. And in the last column, it gets to there. So these groups of letters in the one, instead of staying in that row there, they get all sent down there. So we were able to sort out the sesqui arrays. So the sesqui arrays were finished and that's good. What happened next? What happened next was I went to a very nice meeting on the latest advances in theory and applications of design and analysis of experiments held at the Banff International Research Station. This is in August 2017. They video all the lectures and make them available on the web. And Emlyn Williams learned about this. Now, remember, I've mentioned him twice already in this talk, but I didn't mention that he's an Australian statistician that I'd worked with before. And he saw a link from my webpage, went and saw the video. Oops. And of course, because our designs were better than his, that motivated him to rerun that computer search from the 1970s. With a much more up-to-date version of his search program and a more up-to-date computer, and he found resolvable designs for 36 varieties in up to eight replicates of blocks of size six with no concurrencies bigger than two. And so less than a month after I'd given that talk, 
he emailed me those results. So in spring of the following year, I talked about these designs at a seminar in St. Andrews. So this will not be surprising to you. I was preparing the talk just the day before. I hadn't got on with it. And while I was preparing that talk, I realized a connection with some other designs that I have studied called semi-Latin squares. So I'm going to tell you a bit about semi-Latin squares. A semi-Latin square with parameters n and s, we have an n by n array. And so that's an n by n square. And each cell of that square is actually a block of size S. And then we put N S letters in this array in such a way that each letter occurs once in each row and once in each column. So here's an example. I hope you can quickly see, look, let's see here is A, it comes in that row, in that row, and so on and so forth. Now, an obvious way to take this is put two Latin squares on top of each other. This one is not made from two Latin squares, because if it was, A and B would be in different squares, and A and F would be in different squares, and so would B and F, and that's not possible. But this one has lots of nice automorphisms. Now, going back to our galaxies, the stars, that's the galaxy I've shown you before, centered on column three. And these things with a plus sign are galaxies centered on that column. And so, of course, we've got each letter once in each row and once in each column. So that makes a semi-Latin square. Now, if the two Latin squares you put together like that are mutually orthogonal, the whole thing is called a Trojan square. But it doesn't have to be made that way. And it's easy to show that if there is a Trojan square, it's optimal. But what do we do when n is six? Well, Supposing we've got a semi-Latin square. We can make a block design by putting the varieties in an n by n square array, which is what we've done before. And each letter then gives a block of n varieties. And if the semi-Latin square is made by putting several Latin squares together, the block design is resolvable. And if the block design, this criterion that we're interested in, if that's mu a, and if the semi-Latin square has this criterion lambda a, then there's this relation between them. So if one is good, so is the other. Maximizing mu is the same as maximizing lambda amongst semi-Latin squares of this sort. So do we know anything about good semi-Latin squares for n equals six? Well, several people have looked at this. I did some work then with Gordon Royal. Leonard Seutcher at Queen Mary got interested and did a lot of work. Brickle did something in an entirely different context. And in 2013, Leonard had given one made by superposing several Latin squares. Now this just shows the value of lambda, but that's the thing we want to maximize. The same colors, the blue don't exist and the red are partially balanced. But then we realize that just as with the Sylvester graph, if you make a block design from a semi-Latin square, you also have the option of including another replicate whose blocks are the rows 
and another replicate whose blocks are the columns. And just as before, putting in those two special replicates give better designs than just using the semi-Latin square with 12 more letters. So how do these designs compare? For two and three replicates, all these new series of designs are just square lattice designs. For R between four and seven, they all have efficiency factors very close to the unachievable upper bound. And when R is eight, they all do better than what you would get with a balanced square lattice design and one replicate duplicated. So here are the values that we got from using the Sylvester graph. Here is what Emlyn did by his more recent computer search. And here is what we get from Leonard's designs and his semi-Latin squares. And as you can see, these numbers are actually pretty close. And I have to say now that if there was somebody in the audience who's interested in doing agricultural experiments, he would just say, this is ridiculous. These designs are all equally good. I don't know why you're bothering. But I do care. Now, are any of those designs the same? Well, I say that two block designs are isomorphic if you can permute one into the other by permuting varieties and or permuting blocks. And of course, if two designs are isomorphic, then their efficiency factors are the same, but the converse isn't necessarily true. So look back to these numbers and at four, that number is different. Those two are the same. It's possible that those are isomorphic, but I don't know. At five, they're all different. At six, they're all different. At seven, it might be that those two are isomorphic, but then that one's different. But when you get down to eight, they've got exactly the same efficiency factor. And I mean exact because we've done it in gap. But, so then we look at their concurrence matrices up to permuting treatments, they're the same. And what enabled us to tell the difference was to say, what are their automorphism groups? Because here we've got the Sylvester graph, we've got a very large automorphism group. In Leonard's, it's rather smaller. And because Emlyn Search didn't care about automorphisms, he's only got the identity. So we know that no pair of those three are isomorphic. So a couple of references. Thomas Nelson visited us in St Andrews in 2016-2017. And that eventually led to this paper about sesquiarrays. On the other paper, where we communicated, I told you, Emlyn emailed me <clears throat> when he'd heard my talk. And then, of course, we contacted Leonard after we'd realized the semi Latin squares were important. And towards the end of 2019, they were both able to visit us in St Andrews, and we got the paper finished and it was published right at the end of last year. So that's it, and thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much for your very nice talk, which uh, shows us so good story about the wrong way, but this, this wrong way uh, leads to, to get some interesting, nice uh, results. Uh, are there any questions to to the speaker. Well, I have a small question okay. uh, concerning terminology. Well, actually, uh, sesquire, what, what is the meaning? Is it just uh, one and a half or what, what is the meaning? <laughs> yes, it comes from one and a half. I didn't have time to tell you, but 
there was some earlier work on things called double arrays and triple arrays. Yeah. And when Thomas and Peter were looking for a word for their new designs, they came up with this one and a half. I see. Yes, you're you're absolutely yeah. right. Well done. Yeah, I see. But is there some special connection these properties uh, of uh, of the square? I mean, this table. One and a half. What is the connection to to to, to the design? I mean, I'll let Peter answer that one. Okay. Yeah. So so triple arrays are things that um, I don't know if we can scroll back to the definition of a test. Really. Yes, you can. It's. Quite a long way back. Yes, I'll go back to the definition of a sesquit. Uh, Twelve. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got a little way to go. Yeah. There. Um, okay. So five conditions. Now there's a natural sixth condition as well, which would say the number of letters common to any two columns mm -hmm. is a non-zero constant, and you could oops work out the, the thing for that. And if all of those conditions hold, it's called a triple array. Mm -hmm. And in the literature, if oh, I'm sorry, if mm -hmm. all those conditions except for oh dear, except for A4, if you leave out A4 and just take A5 and this new condition A6, that's mm -hmm. a double array, right? I see, right, so we've yeah. Got, uh, uh, we've got uh, of the, the last three conditions, mm -hmm. A5 and A6 are sort of... Uh, dual to each other and A4 is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So we've got half of the two dual conditions plus one times the A4 condition, and that's one and a half. So I see. Okay. I see. That is, I see. I see. Yeah. <laughs> because you see, actually, it, it is not, not, not easy to see why it is so. Yeah. You're right. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. That's the reason. That's yeah. exactly the reason I came up I with see. That I yeah. see. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. For pedantism in naming, yeah, it is really yeah. very important. Yeah, yes, it is. To have good, yeah, to have good terminology. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Yes, yes. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Well, actually, I have one remark uh, dealing with auto automorphism of the symmetric group of degree six. Uh -huh. It seems to me that it was one talk given by Ivan Magil. Uh, on uh, perfect chords in the star graphs. So uh, almost the same situation appears when he uh, could get some new result by using this auto automorphism. Oh, uh, yeah? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So that is interesting. I, I will inform you about uh, your talk because uh, he is not with us today, but I'm sure that it would be interesting to hear. Okay. Yes. yes, yes please yes. do. He's involved in coding theory. Yeah. Uh, no, yes. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe well, it would be useful, yeah. Well, let me just add something to that. Okay. I wrote a book with Jack Van Lint, which has quite a lot of coding theory in it. But chapter six of that book is about the outer automorphism of S6, and I deliberately made it chapter six. Uh, <laughs> but that uses it to construct uh, the projected plane of order four, the Steiner system on 12 points, and the Moore graph, uh, the Singleton see. graph. They can all be I constructed see. very easily from the outer automorphism of S6. It's a wonderful thing to work with, to play with. <laughs> and, and yes, it, do, it does show the things we need in experimental design have a big overlap with the things that people in coding theory do. Uh -huh. People are, are not always aware of the connections and that's why sometimes this different vocabulary grows. Uh -huh. Right, yeah. I see. Thank you very much for this very nice remark, yeah. That is interesting, yeah.